Good evening. Uh, my I met Deepak Garia by accident. I didn't seek him out, nor did he really seek me out. We just bumped into each other at a conference, and he asked me what my interest was, and I said I'm looking at renewable energy. He said, I'm into renewable energy. I said, can we talk? And that's how we began talking to each other. Maybe it is accidental, but the meeting was exciting to say the least. I was very interested in whatever he had to say and he was interested in whatever I had to talk about or whatever I wanted to learn about. And if one looks at his life, even his foray into renewable energy was an accident. I don't think he would have been in India had it not been for the accident. He was enamored enough by a talk by the former Prime Minister of India, Rajiv Gandhi, when before he became Prime Minister, he went to Germany, met him at one of the forums, and told him, why are you Indians staying in Germany? You should be back in India helping us. And he was inspired enough, maybe naive enough to believe Rajiv Gandhi came to India, thinking that the invitation was a personal one. He was so enamored that he told his friends, the Prime Minister's called me, I must go back. When he came to India, he realized the invitation was not personal. It was a generic one. There was no one to hold his hand. <laughs> he had to fend for himself. And because he had to fend for himself, he discovered new ways. And one after another, stumbled down the roadways that led to renewable energy. And unlike many other people who talk about a technology or a product, he looks at an entire ecosystem. You've not come here to listen to me. You've come to listen to him. I hand you over to him, Deepak Adhya. Thank you. Thank you, Bhaskar. Thank you, Shruti and Lina and Shruti. Shruti and Kim and dear friends. I'm very glad that my father has come to listen to me. And uh, I have a friend from Germany, Mr. Phillips, who's also there. Um, I, I did not expect so many people. Uh, that uh, that in Bombay at evening time, uh, which is normally the time to go for a walk or the sunset. So I'm going to talk about the sunrise, how I got into solar. Basically, it's going to be a very personal story. I will walk you through how I evolved into become a solar entrepreneur. And I would have not become what I am if my father would have not let me go. You know, I come from a business family. My father was a businessman. He would have, like all fathers, emotionally blackmailed me and told me, I want you to be here and take care of the business. But he said, no, go and fly, see the world, you do what you want. So I'm very thankful to him and my mother and parents that they have given me the opportunity to be here. See, in India we say normally that when you marry, you add a person to your family. But in my case, he lost one person to the family. I married a foreigner and moved out. I will talk about it, but he has never stopped me. So Papa, thank you very much again for everything. Uh, next please. So I'm not going to talk about my company or my product. Actually, when you look at my biodata, I have none. I am active in the field of solar energy. I do a lot of things, but I don't offer any particular product. I offer solutions. And uh, this is what Pascal talked about. Uh, I studied in here. I was born and brought up in Bombay. So I'm glad to be back at my roots. And I was a city boy. For me, Bombay was India, and India is Bombay. And uh, it was more by chance that I went to Germany for my education. And uh, like everyone else, I was of the belief that our country requires high technology. We thought that our country does not make progress because the Western economy <coughs> is a good technology for themselves and give us the trash so that we depend on them all the time. So I decided to study process and environmental engineering and I ran into a nice beautiful woman, my wife, uh, Dr. Shirin Garia, you see her other top, Rajiv Gandhi, and we decided to marry. Luckily, she was also of Indian origin, also an idealist, also wanted to do something for the world, something for India. And uh, it was in 1984 that we met uh, Rajiv Gandhi in a, one of the NRI conferences. And when he heard about our biodata that I am a process and environmental engineer and my wife a PhD in genetic engineering, he was very impressed. And also he was more impressed that we were willing to do something for the country. And he said, we need people like you coming back, because at that time the big problem was brain drain, you know, like people were going away. Even now it's, it's a big problem because 70% of our IIT students move our country, educates and gives the green infrastructure. Do not stay here but go away and work for the US company. 
I'm nothing against them because I think they also contribute and India has become a big IT power because of all of the NRIs living there and bringing business to India. But I think what we also need is something where people will come back with a larger horizon and bring back what we perhaps need. So when we got a personal invitation from him, he says, why don't you come back, we need people like you. It's the biggest ego massage a young couple can get. So we were very thrilled and so he decided to come back. And we started telling, you know, you, at, at that age you are a bragger, you like to talk about it, you like to throw names, you like to impress people. So we started telling everyone, I'm going to go back, my country gives me, my prime minister has invited me and all. And people were some impressed, most of them. Till we met an old German lady who was not impressed, she said, oh, what a pity. So we were like, never, we had come across such a reaction, so I said, why do you say that? And she says, I like the idea of you going back, but I don't like the idea of you helping a country with high technology. Because what your country requires is an appropriate technology. You were too young to understand that. So we thought, oh, it's typical German, she doesn't want us to grow. Uh, again, she's an old lady, so my generation gap. So we said, okay, you're a nice person, we do, it's my country, I know what my country is. So thank you very much. And we came back. Okay, like Bhaskar said, Raji Gandhi is a great guy. He was a visionary, he wanted to do something for India, he was a clean man. But unfortunately, by the time he came back, he was a prime minister and he had already got integrated to buffers, problems and all. And again, perhaps what he meant when he said we need people like you and you come back and help the country. I thought it was a personal invitation for us to come back and we thought we will be Sam Petrola of India, just like he gave Sam Petrola a big importance, we will be Sam Petrola of solar energy. Unfortunately, that was not to be and we were left to ourselves. So I had no choice but to go back to working for a German company selling heat recovery system, the area I was into, and my wife was left for herself. She was very disappointed with India she saw. She was Indian origin, so she had seen India in movies, the Bollywood. And you know how our Bollywood is, you know, an illusionary world, nice world with songs and music and love and sacrifice. So she was very disappointed that India was not what she thought it would be. And uh, when she tried to go to people and saying, look, I've come from Germany and I would like to do something for the country, she was shocked to hear from people that we don't require you. At that time, NRI was not required Indian, you know. Uh, and we have enough brains in our country, only thing we require is money. And we have no problems. So she was provoked and she said, how come you talk of no problems? I see so many problems. And she started cutting into newspapers and identified 26 of them. But again, realizing that she was all left to herself. I was always traveling around the world. So she says, I will start with something which is most relevant, and that was water. Because at that time, we were living in Baroda. Three years, there was consecutive drought, and there was no drinking water for people who could not afford. People who could afford, they had everything. She was surprised to see there were two countries in India. There were cities which had everything, running water, electricity, infrastructure, 110 TV channels. And a few kilometers away, there were villages which had no road, no drinking water, no power, and people were left on their own. So she said, I will go and talk to people and educate them not to destroy the economy or ecology. The people whom she talked to in Baroda were not interested. They were too busy. You know how our city boys are, city people are. We have no time for, we have enough problems. You don't want to hear of problem. So she started going to villages and started telling people in villages, don't cut the forest because if you cut forest, there will be less rainfall. So there will be one more drought. And then people told her, you know what, madam, uh, we have enough uh, we know that what we are doing is wrong. We, should, we live with the forest, we know the importance of the forest, but if we do not cut trees, how will we survive? We cannot afford kerosene. We, can, we have LPG is a uh, dream which is uh, too far away for us. Electricity is also intermittent. So we know that we should not do it, but we have no option. So it's very easy for you to say, don't do this, don't do that. What is the solution? And so she looked at me and said, oh, why don't you look, uh, help me with the solution? I was an energy guy. I had done my process in environmental energy and then my post-graduation in energy conservation, energy management. So that's how I was again drawn into it. Initially, I was not very convinced what my wife was doing was right. You know, because like all typical men, I was happy that she was busy so that I could do what I wanted. <laughs> but, so I wanted to sort of buy peace, and so I said, okay, I will find you a solution. At that time, there was no Google, so I went, I had to go library to UDCT and all and try to do some literature. So I found out there was already a technology called solar box cooker with which you could cook without using wood. So I was very impressed when I came across it, and I said, great, there is already a solution. If I, as a Bombay, Voila, do not know about it. If I have been inspired of having traveled around the world, I do not know about it. How will a poor village know about it? So maybe they do not know about it. So I went to the village and then talked to them about a the box cooker. Next, please. When my wife told me about the problem and when, when I started doing the research, I was surprised that in 21st century at that time, when you were talking of landing on the moon and uh, conquering Mars, 50% of the world population, not India, cooks on open fire. Even now, till today, 50% of the world cooks on open fire. 
the smoke in the kitchen is the third world's largest killer. It's not TB, it's not AIDS, it's the smoke in the kitchen. But because we do not so see it, we do not know it, and uh, that's why it's called the silent killer. So I realized that it was not just a problem of forest, it was about environment, it was about health, so it was a very interrelated problem. Uh, so I decided to solve. Next, please. My wife, she had started an NGO, means when she came back, and the NGO's name was uh, Eco Center Ikinir. The Eco Center is, means a place where you can talk about ecology, and not only talk, but you can see the ecology in action. And the name was, Ikinir was abbreviation of International Center for Networking, Ecology, Education, and Reintegration. Because we suddenly realized that in India, means I'm sorry if there are some Brahmin friends, I mean, I'm also, a, in a way, a Brahmin, I also wear Janoya and all, but I think our economy is based on know-how. All what we learn, we try to keep to ourselves. A Brahmin will keep the Shatra to himself and not write it down and only pass it on orally to his children. A trader will keep all the know-how from where he buys at what price to himself. So we are, and the artisan will only teach his son whatever he knows uh, so that it, he gets a better start in his life. So we realized that if we were to bring, share knowledge, we could perhaps have a, a common start. We don't have to replicate efforts or we have to reinvent the wheel as they say. So we said network is very important. So network is not just socializing and exchanging cards, but networking, sharing of experiences, learning from each other. Ecology, because my wife realized that India was making the same mistake like the West. The Western economy is based on theory of growth. It believes that if you grow, is economic growth, the uh, prosperity will per uh, percolate down and then you remove poverty. And that's what India is following, or all the countries in the world are following. The communism, the communism is dead, as, they, as we all say. But I think it's not a communism that was defeated, it was the materialism which has won. So ultimately, it's, uh, uh, she realized that if we cannot do that, we cannot have, make a progress of economic progress at the cost of ecology. And that economy and ecology has to go healthy and healthy. So she worked, started working on ecology and wood forest was one of them. And then she realized about waters because she started with water. So she started looking at water conservation and how to, and then suddenly she came into organic farming. So she started offering integrated solutions and energy I was to do. Education, because we realize that whatever we know, if we do not share it, it's not going to multiply. And we came across a sentence which said that if you teach someone to, if you give someone a fish, you have helped him for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, you have helped him for the life. So we realized that education is the only thing. Means my father always used to say that your money will come and go, but education no one can take away. The more you give, the more you will get, because that's, we, we grow into that. And then reintegration, because we realized that there were many people like us who had gone abroad and who wanted to come back but were afraid to come back because of the social pressure. Because everyone thinks that someone who has gone abroad comes with money. Because most of the people we know who have come back are from people from Dubai, Muscat. So they go and work there hard and come with few lakhs rupees. So people normally expect people to come. And students, we go as a student, we don't bring money. We bring education, but there was no value. So they would not come back because of the social pressure. So we said, if we can bring them back, that would be the reversal of brain drain we were talking about. And these people had a larger horizon. They had lived in the West, and they had a belief in themselves, and they also have a belief in India. See, basically what happened was when I was in Bombay, I was more a foreigner than an Indian. I believed in the West. I could not understand English music, but I would dance to it. I will wear shoes, I will wear Western clothes, because we think West is the best. It's only after I going back to Germany, I realized that we have a great country, a great culture, only we do not know it. So I became Indian outside India, not in India. So I said, if we can bring such people, then we will be able to give confidence, which was lacking. I will give you a simple example. Please don't quote me. I don't want to be rusticated from Amul Dairy. But when I was working for a German company, I was sent to India to install a plant at Amul Dairy. To my shock, the Amul Dairy people said, we do not want you to install the system. We want a white, a Gora man to come and install it. So I said, why? He says, you are an Indian. If something goes wrong, we will not get a guarantee. We want a white person. Now, just imagine my situation. I have to go back to my company and tell me that my own people do not want me because they do not trust me. So what do I do? I do what Gandhi taught us. A white lie is not a bad lie. I came to Bombay, picked up two foreigners, tourists, and said, I will give you five days holiday, five days you have to work with me. They came as my boss. They would say yes when I said yes. They would say no when I said no. And I installed the plant. <laughs> but that's the state of our country. We do not believe in ourselves. So we said reintegration would be a great thing to do. So we started this NGO. So again, coming back to how I got into solar next. So this is a very simple technology box cooker. I'm sure many of you know about it. This is a technology which works like a heat trap. It's a box with a glass onto it. And just like when we come into summer uh, at 12 o'clock noon, when we get into our car, our car is not a car, it's an oven, 42 to 60 degree hot. You cannot put your hand on the dashboard, you will burn it, it will get boils. Why, why does that happen? Simple principle, glass has a property of allowing the light to come in, but not allowing the heat to go out. So that's why our car becomes a heat trap. 
in the same way this box becomes a heat trap it is insulated from all side the glass allows the light to go in it is painted black so the black color absorbs the heat the temperature in the oven goes to 140 degree so you put cooking vessels and you can cook into it and i was thrilled i said wow there is already a technology i don't have to reinvent now i can solve the problem and i went to village again very young very arrogant so i went to villages and you know what villages you are very poor because you are ignorant you know with that uh, pride of being a foreigner return guy and all and see miss you told me problem in two days i can come with a solution and, and for you have been doing for 50 years you not looked at a solution so and so what's what's the solution i said look this is the box cooker with which you can now do everything you can cook and everything and all so the villager asked me oh deepa great have you ever used a solar cooker i said no he said why don't you go and use one so what do you think that means the solar cooker is not working because we have, we have spoken too early i went back and purchased a solar cooker and cooked on it and to my happiness and surprise it worked i could cook food onto it not was it was the food ready but also it was very nutritious because you cook at a low temperature it was also very tasty because it does not have the smell of kerosene and wood and ash and all so i said now what is the problem so again i went back to village i said hey look you wasting my time you, why do you say go and use a cooker i used it it's great so what's the problem they said now you have used the cooker now we can talk about the problem they went back and few people brought their solar cooker and i opened i was surprised that they had a cooker and they made me buy a new one I, they could have given me their one but then they wanted me to spend money so that i really know the value of money so i opened the box cooker to my surprise in one box cooker there was sarees in other one it was lipstick because there is a glass mirror where they can do all the lipstick in one was jewelry somewhere some spices so i said you have a solar cooker you know it works and why don't you use it and they said the problem is we know a solar cooker works will you use it tomorrow i said of course now that i have purchased i will use it tomorrow i know it works and day after tomorrow i said i am very busy man i do not know he says if you as a rich man are busy we are more busy because we have to fight for survival the problem with the solar cooker is it cooks but it cooks very slow it takes about one and a half to two hours to cook it cannot fry and any indian food without frying is not because we have to give our tadka or vaghar whatever we call it it cannot make chapati so if you have to start a fire anyway we can as well put the rice and dal also on it so i realized that here was a technology which was functional but not acceptable to people or it was acceptable there were only 600000 solar cookers in india in 50 years in spite of 70% subsidy and out of that 500000 300000 cookers were used for putting sarees and lipsticks so it it was it was a technology is not is a non starter i still am convinced that this is the best technology most cost economical most appropriate but we our expectations are too high you know as it's like i want an engineer with 10 years experience but he should be 23 years old that means we should be done engineering by 13 years so our expectations are from technology also too high we don't want to change we want technology to change for us and that also sasta sara whatever everything we want practically free so i had to bring a solution so i said okay what do i do so i remember a colleague of mine dr zaifer who was working with me and he had told me all the time i have a technology with which you can now fry you can make chapati you can cook very fast and he had taken me to his house to show that and i had seen a dish antenna like product looked at it and said what is it he says a dish antenna is how does it cook he says you have to put in the sun and it will come i looked at it the size was 1.4 meter i said if i buy this solar cooker i have to sleep in my balcony because my house is too small so i said it's not a start no one will india will buy a solar cooker but now that i had come to villages and when i realized that 70% of our population live in villages where space is not a problem i said okay now i need the technology because there is a market there is a need and there is a solution so i will bring that so i brought the chef technology i mean sk14 technology to india manufactured them and then uh, sold it to some friends of mine and I, i was already a middle class because when you come back from germany your D, dm that time deutsche mark was already 1 to 20 rupees so i was a bit richer than a poor man so my buyers or my friends were middle class and they purchased it uh, in those days in gujarati there was not a tradition of hugging my even my mother would not hug me and all because it's not common in gujarati to hug and all and this lady my friend's wife she was so happy that she gave me a beautiful hug you know and i was so thrilled i said great you know the technology is excited so much that she has forgotten her tradition that's a sign of acceptance so again after 15 days i was passing by i said now let's go in a night go in a nice hug again don't take it in a physical form the hug was more the warmth because she was elder to me but still a hug is a hug so i went there and she opened the door doesn't look at me and go away and tells are you know aapka friend aaya hua hai I said, what's wrong? Like last time, she was the happiest woman. Now she doesn't want to talk with me. I said, maybe my friend has provoked. They are fighting. So, to, so I went and told my friend, "Kya bhai, kya jhagda kiya tu ne wife ke saath mein? What's the problem? Why did you?" He says, "No, it's not me. It's you." I said, "How do I do it?" He says, "You know, like I forced her to buy the solar cooker. She was very happy. Now she has to go in the sun." 
So I went and called Bhabi Bhai, what's the problem? He said, Deepakal, you know, you talk so nicely, so we thought you were a very nice person, gone and seen the world, you want to change the world, help the woman. But you're a typical man. You men sit in the comforts of your air-conditioned room and you want us, the woman, to go into the sun. If you really want to us, bring a technology where the sun comes in the kitchen. So I realized that a woman are very difficult to satisfy, you know. And, but they were right. If I would have been a woman, I would have also thought the same thing. So I said, okay, now I will go for it. So I went back to Germany and talked to my friend and said, hey, can you give me a technology where the sun comes in the kitchen? My woman do not want to go out. So they said, no problem. I don't have it, but I have a friend of mine, Mr. Wolfgang Scheffler. He is a solar cooker which can do that. So I went to him and said, can you give me the technology? And again, Gujaratis, we are banyas, you know, businessmen. So we always think that if you want to take something, we have to give something. So I thought there will be a technology transfer, joint venture agreement, royalty and everything. And to my surprise, both these gentlemen gave me the technology free of charge. So I, initially I was worried. I said, why is he giving me free? There is some thing, some secret somewhere, you know, that means he wants me to buy some components or something. So I asked him, why would you want to give me free? He says, you know, Deepak, if something happens to me, my country will take care of me. Education is free. If I grow old, uh, means my old age is taken care of. If I fell sick, medicine is free. What right do I have to take money from India? So that was the first time my pride of being India, the monopoly, we think that we have the monopoly of Gandhi. That's not wrong. Gandhis are everywhere. We just need to reach out. So I got the, both this technology to India, brought them, and I brought the technology of Chef Le Cooker next. So here you can see that uh, parabolic solar cooker, which works like a dish antenna. And just like we burn paper with magnifying glass or, a, or a, a specs, where you concentrate energy, it works in the same way. The whole, all the light falling onto the parabola gets reflected through the focus. In the focus, the temperature is about 250 degrees centigrade, you put a cooking vessel. The only difference is that cooking vessel has to be painted black so that it absorbs the heat, otherwise it will reflect and take a bit longer time. And you can cook, you can fry, you can make chapatis, everything and all, but which was not acceptable for the... Again, the problem was there are 70% people living in villages. They work in sun all the time. They have no problem of going in the sun. It's only the us middle class and the rich who have problem of going in the sun. So the problem, the dichotomy was there were people who wanted it but could not afford it. And people who could afford it did not need it because they were getting subsidized LPG in their cities, you know, so why would they want to go in the sun? So I said, no, I have to do something what people wanted. And this woman gave me the slogan, I want to cook in the comfort of my kitchen. So I brought a technology where you can do that next. So now you can see here, there's a technology where you put a dish outside and reflect the light to the small opening in the wall of your kitchen. And it is reflected onto a secondary reflector and it deflects the light onto your cooking vessel. So now you can cook in the comforts of the kitchen. Next. Can you see the woman very happy, very smiling and all? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next, please. So now you can see, uh, I have a solar cooker which brings a uh, light in your kitchen and you can cook in the comfort of the kitchen. But again, the problem was the woman who wanted to cook in the comfort of the kitchen did not want to spend one lakh rupees, which was the cost of cooker now. See, the cooker became expensive because now it, you have not one dish but two dish. Then it has to move like a sunflower, it has to move with the sun because it has to be automatic. So you have to have a tracking device which will keep on moving the dish along with the sun. And then you have to have a controlled temperature. So a woman said, I don't want to buy a cooker for one lakh rupees. So then I said, no, what do I do? I have a product, but now I have, don't have a buyer. So I said, okay, I modified. So I converted that community into a community cooker where, where with a large dish you can cook for 50 people. And my target was schools, midday meal programs. Because India, we have this big program of midday meal program where to get the poor into the school, we give free meal to the children. So actually you help their nutrition, at the same time you bring them to education. You know, otherwise, I remember the slogan, uh, one more mouth, one more child means one more mouth to feed. You know, when the family planning was there, it totally failed. Because the poor people came up with the smoke slogan, one more mouth to feed but two hands to work. So basically they would, they, they saw children as assets and not as liabilities. So I said, if we can give them education, free food, so one child was in the school and so we targeted him. It was fulfilling our target. We were now educating and showing children that it was possible to cook without smoke, without cutting forest. And it was a win-win situation, so it's a community cooker. And we are very successful. We have supplied more than 250 systems all over India, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Okha to uh, Calcutta. <coughs> As you can see here, next. This is the solar flare, the solar flame which is coming. It's not a flame of a, a gas or a wood or something. It's a solar flame, very bright. And when you want to cook, you don't want to have high temperature, you want to have controlled temperature. Because when you put rice, you put a very high flame and when the water starts boiling, you turn it down. So I realized that my cooker is not going to work, otherwise my food is going to get burned, so I have to now control the temperature. So how do I do it? I had learned from this German lady the word appropriate. What is the word appropriate? Appropriate technology is a technology where you can make it with local material, with locally available skill. It should be operated by local people, it should be maintained by local people. So I said, now I, have to, I don't want to make it very high-tech gadget. 
So with a very simple mechanism, what I have is a small window in front of that opening. So if I close the window half, half the light comes in. If I open one fourth, only one fourth light comes in. If I close it, it's closed. So it's now it's like a gas. You can do on, off, high flame, low flame, just like that. So with very simple cost effective solutions, by Mr. Einstein had said that what is not common is common sense. We, I don't know why we call it common sense, because we don't want to apply our mind. As they say in Gujarati, we don't like to hear hold over here like this. We always like to hear it like this, because it's high tech, complex. We like complexities in life. So we made it very simple. Next. Then the problem, people said, oh, this is great, but my cooks would not use it. The cooks means the cooks in the institution. And I asked them, why are you not using it? And they said, the problem is that previously I would come at 6 o'clock in the morning, go away at 9 o'clock. Now I have to start cooking at 9, because the sun only comes at 9 o'clock. I cannot cook at night. I have to work the whole day. If the, some money is saved, my institution get it. I don't get any extra money for the extra work. So I realized that I have to do, develop a storage system. I have to store the energy and be able to cook early morning at night. So I developed a technology again where now you can store the energy. It's a very simple technology again. There are complex technologies of splitting chemicals. And when you combine them again, they are exothermic reactions. They can give energy. But my villagers were the people who do not understand chemistry. I did not want to bring chemistry in the villages. So it's a metal block. It's a shafting from an old ship cut, insulated from all sides, and you put the focus onto the opening, it becomes 450 degree hot. You insulate it at top with a lid, and when you want to cook at night, you can cook on it. So it's like an electrical hot plate. You can cook also at night when the sun is not there. So again, it's a storage system. Next. And one day, suddenly, I get a call from Brahma Kumari. Brahma Kumari is a spiritual institution in Mount Abu, a very uh, big group growing uh, day by day. And they said they want to cook for 1,200 people. They are teaching meditation, yoga, but they're not the physical yoga, but meditation. Uh, and they would like to cook with solar energy because it's a spiritual energy. And I said, no problem. Here are my technologies. With one dish, you can cook for 50 people, 100 young children. Buy 15 of them, and you can cook for 1,200 people. And they said, no, they cannot do that. Because if you use your technology, our kitchen has to be having a north-facing wall through which the light can come in the kitchen. Our kitchen is not on the north side. Second problem is that there are too many buildings around it, so there will be a lot of shadows. So they said, why don't you put the dish on the terrace and reflect the light from top to bottom? So my first reaction was, hey, get lost. I am the scientist. You are not a scientist. But then I had also learned that ultimately it's the people who tell you. And one thing we have to learn is that people have some ideas in their mind. Maybe they are not articulate. They do not express their wish, but they have some solutions. Only we need to hear them properly. That's why they say you have to read between two lines. So I had to read between two lips, which was not expressing. So I said, why do they say that? And I realized that in every one of us, in our school days, we have made a periscope to see the submarine, where we have got two mirrors at 45 degree, and we deflect the right, and you can see the submarine coming. So I realized that people were trying to tell me, why don't you put two mirrors instead of one and bring the light from top to bottom? But in physics, we also know that the more you deflect, the more you lose, because a mirror does not reflect all the light. So I said, no, I cannot do that. And then the idea came, why do I have to bring light in the kitchen? Ultimately, we cook with heat. So again, I went back to my German company where I was working, which was a company called HTT, and there was world leaders in thermal engineering. I said, I have a technology where I can bring my light in the kitchen to 500 degrees centigrade. And they said, forget light, we'll bring steam. So now what we did was we modified the system. So here you see two dishes reflecting light onto the heat exchanger in the center, in the focus. There is a header pipe from which the water comes in. Because of the 500 degrees centigrade, the water starts boiling, becomes steam, and then the steam goes to the kitchen. So for the first time we developed in the world, we developed a technology where now the dish can be in the terrace. And instead of light, you're bringing heat in the kitchen, you can cook in the comfort of the kitchen. Next. So here you see a steam cooking system, a uh, kitchen, the terrace, the dishes, the, the, uh, the dishes could be on the terrace or it could be far away from your shed where the shadow is not there and the steam is coming by pipeline. In chemical plants, there are hundreds of kilometers of pipeline. So steam can be tran transported anywhere. Maybe there is a pressure drop somewhere and then you can cook. And suddenly I learned a new way of cooking because normally what we thought is when you want to cook, we cook at home on a small flame. When you see the Chinese, he has a bigger flame. When you go to the marriage, you have the bigger flame, you know? So I always thought that it's just a question of larger flame to cook large quantity. Here it was possible to cook for thousands of people in such small cooking vessel. Because you can cook 32 kilograms of rice in 12 minutes. You directly inject the steam into your cooking vessel, the rice get cooked, you take it out, put the next batch, you can cook, you know? So instead of having those big tawas with all the flame, it, the food is very tasty in marriages because all the pasinas and all go into it. But then it's not hygiene. But it, we all go for taste. You know, I, I like bail puri. My father always says, eat bail. You'll never fall sick, you know. You become immune. <laughs> so you could then directly inject the steam into your cooking vessel and cook, or you have a jacketed vessel, and you can cook something like milk. Why can't you put water in the uh, steam into your milk? Because our dudhwala bhaiya has already added enough water. 
So if you put steam, it will add water to it, then there is more water than milk. So the idea is that you put a jacketed vessel, you can heat the water or soup with jacketing. So you can see now both technologies, direct injection, steam vessels. Next, please. Next. So this is the world's largest solar steam cooking we have installed. This is a Shirdi temple and it cooks for 50,000 people. So we kept on evolving. From Brahma Kumar we started, then we did 10,000 people and then we did Tirupati. I will show you afterwards, 30,000 people. This is the world's largest solar steam cooking system where we have got 73 dishes of 16 square meter producing steam and then steam goes into the kitchen and cooks 50,000 meals per day. Next. So here you can see all the dishes, they are all onto the terrace. Next. This is a Tirupati temple. There was a different technology where we had two dishes reflecting light onto the heat exchangers. We have 106 uh, dishes there. Next. And here you can see the whole system on the terrace. Now what I learned was that anything you do as an individual, there is a limit. You know, we always say, Ms. I, and I, I agree with them, we Indians are the brightest people. There's no doubt about it. But we are still not the most progressive people. Why? Because we are individualist. If we work, we want to do everything of ourselves. We do not learn in delegation. We do not work in team. So your efficiency, and my boss would tell me, your efficiency is 110%. You work better than a German. But I put two Indians together, your efficiency becomes 70% because you don't work, you talk a lot. And if there are three, then you fight a lot, you know. So we need to learn in team. And basically, I realized that if I want to do solar system, I cannot, I can, I'm a solar scientist. I know technology, but I, don't, I have to now do, do wind loads. I have to do civil engineering. I have to do transfer of loads. I have to do heat exchangers and piping. So I started creating a team of people who are similar like me, thinking of doing something great. I paid them salary also, but it was more the motivation. It was the challenge which brought them together, and we did it. Next. This is a system. So initially, it was very easy for me to sell my system because who are my buyers? Temples. And temples give out money very easily because it's not their money. It is our money. <laughs> and we give money to our temples, not to our poor, because God gives us, you know, if you give temples, you will go to the heaven. If you give to the poor, you will go to the heaven. So, uh, so temples give easily. But I said, my temples are there. Can I move away from temples? Can I become sustainable? So I looked at new markets. Who were my market? IBM. Industries. They have industrial canteens. But the problem with IBM is they want to go not because of economics. They want to go because they are green, environmental friendly. So this is at IBM. But they said, we will not let you put the dish on the terrace because this is a parking place. You know, I, uh, in IBM, everyone comes in the car. They earn in dollars. So uh, this is a six-story building with uh, 270 cars being parked. In each and every parking place on the terrace is costing 2.7 lakhs rupees. So I said, we will not let you work the terrace. So I have to put my system again on the terrace, built a structure. So for me, it was great because now when you park your car below my solar cooker, your car does not get heated because the light is reflected away into the water. So it's a solar air conditioning, you know. So this is perfect way of uh, working solar system in hybrid mode. Next. Then we moved to the new target group, who Indian Army. Indian Army needs to cook for soldiers. And this is in Ladakh. The, this is the world's highest solar cooker at 3,300 uh, 3, meters. The photograph is beautiful because of the snow peak mountains and blue sky. But I've kept it not because it's beautiful. I've kept it to explain to you, please don't, do not confuse solar energy with ambient temperature. Because a lot of people tell me, oh, solar energy is going to work in Rajasthan, Gujarat. It will not work in Kashmir. It will not work in Himachal Pradesh. It will not work in uh, the uh, cold areas. It will work only in summer, not in winter. It's not true. A solar system works on light, radiation, and not on heat. So here the temperature is minus 15 degrees centigrade. But still, the solar system works, it works better than in, uh, wind, uh, in summer and in, better than in Rajasthan because the skies are clear, the radiation is better, so the system works better. Next. This shows everything. This was a kitchen by the Indian Army before we installed the solar cooker. You can see all the problems I talked about. The soot, the smoke, the heat, the unhygienic conditions. Next, please. The same kitchen converted to solar energy. It's clean, it's hygienic, it's quick, it's comfortable. You can use stainless steel vessels because normally when you want to do mass cooking, you have those copper or aluminum or uh, messing vessels which are uh, having heavy metals so which goes into your stomach and creates cancer. So now you can use stainless steel vessels. So solar co steam cooking system had all the advantages, not only solar steam, any steam cooking system has more advantages. So uh, we did many, many systems. We have installed more than 50 systems all over from, we started with, as I said, temples and industries and canteens and hospitals and jails. So we have a very large target group. Next. Then the problem again was with steam, you can only boil things, you cannot fry, you cannot make chapatis, you cannot store energy. So what we have done is we have now oil, uh, thermic fluid, a synthetic oil, which can be heated to 300 degrees centigrade. It is a closed loop, so it's a heat carrier. It does not burn, but it just carries the heat from your solar system to the kitchen. You cook with it, and again it comes back to solar energy, you get heated again. You can store at night and you can cook at night. So we have to keep on evolving. Next. So again, suddenly you see the same system. I'm, someone is cooking here. It's cooking, but it's doing something else. Now basically we started asking ourselves what something is wrong. We came from Germany to help the poor and now we are helping the people who can help themselves. 
the temples who have enough money, the industries who have enough money, who get depreciation benefit, the jails and hospitals who are least bothered about it, it's not their money. How do I help my villager? And then suddenly we said, why is, there, why is there poverty? Why is India poor? How can a country be poor, a country like India be poor if Israel, which has no rainfall, very poor soil, can grow oranges and export things? Why can't a country like India with all climatic zones be poor? And how can a person who grows food go hungry? So there's something fundamentally wrong. And then we started asking ourselves and we realized the problem was that our population lives in villages. So what's wrong with that? The problem is not villages, the problem is that they live on agriculture. And because a farmer produces a product which is perishable, he has to sell it in two to three days. If he do not sell it, then he has to throw it away. So the problem is not the product, it's a perishability. So I said, if we can convert that, how do we do that? So again, if I example here, what you see is a farmer is cooking, next. He is making potato chips. A potato chips is not good for my health. I can, you can see I'm fat and bald, everything because all the fast food I eat. But it's good for the farmer. Because if a farmer sells potatoes, he gets 10 rupees per kilogram. But the same potatoes converted into potato chips gives you 400 to 600 rupees per kilogram. So first thing, he converts the product from perishable into non-perishable. He can sit on it, he'll get a better price. He creates income generation at a village level. So now he doesn't have to migrate to cities to create slums. Maybe we will get less servant, but then I, I don't think that's a very human way of looking at things that, oh, because I don't get servants. I know that a lot of people were very angry when the slums in our area in Juskim were removed, because now suddenly we do not get servant because servant is now living in Jogeshwar, he doesn't want to come to Parla. So we are also selfish, we are only looking at our convenience, we are not worried that a person now lives in a better human conditions. So here the farmers was very happy because he can do a lot of better things. Next. We started working on new applications, now you can make bread, biscuit, uh, pizza, bases and all at village level and value addition, so this is a solar oven, next. And then we came across an article in Time magazine which said that the first and the second world war was because of water, I mean oil, but the third world war is going to be because of water. So we said, do we want to wait till that? As they say, so we said, now let's start working on the solution. So we found a very simple, so how does nature work? Nature also, we have 97% of the water in sea, it is evaporated by the sun, it condenses and comes down as water, drinking water. So we are doing the same thing here, now we put the sea water into our system, we make it steam and then you condense the steam, steam condensed condense steam is nothing but distilled water, you add a 0.1% water again to give it a bit of taste and become minerals and you have drinking water. So we started working on de desalination, next. Then again, uh, I am a part of an ashram called Muniseva Ashram, which is a great institution in Baroda, which is an integrated project, you will hear more about it. Uh, and my chairman said, you know what Deepak, you are typical, you give me heat when it's hot, can you not give me air conditioning when it is hot? So I said, if I am able to do that, then it will be great, because my problem is my target group is poor men, so it's not a product. My product does everything, but people cannot afford it, but if I make an air conditioning, then I am targeting the rich, they don't mind spending, because air conditioning is a luxury, and they have the money to spend it. So I said, if I can produce cooling with the heat, it's perfect, because I don't have to store it, because you just want air conditioning when it's hot. So I looked at it and I came to know that there was already a cycle called vapor absorption system where you do air conditioning with steam, uh, steam or heat. So only thing I had to do was the ashram was already having an air conditioning plant working with a wood fired boiler. You see here, they were consuming 1000 kilograms of wood every day to produce a steam to run air conditioning. So I replaced the wood fired boiler with my solar steam. Next. So this is the vapor absorption chiller which works on either on ammonia water or lithium bromide. I will not go into technologies. I will just keep on talking about solutions which has emerged. Next. And in this lithium bromide, you chill the water at 6 degrees and the chilled water goes to your hospital, then you've got air handling unit where you cool the air into the whole hospital. So central air conditioning plant, just like we have in our air theaters or in malls, you don't have split ACs there, you know, it's all central AC. Next. And these are my solar dishes, 100 dishes of 12.5 square meter producing 400 kilogram of steam at 8.5 kg pressure doing the air conditioning. So I was very happy that for the first time in the world we did a solar air conditioning plant where now you not uh, only use for cooking and for process, food processing but you can also use for air conditioning. For me, the market is not air conditioning alone. Now my market is cold storage. We got, in India we've got 550,000 villages. Each and every village we could have many cold storages in our farm. If you want to conserve product, agriculture product, either you do food processing, or either you do cold storage or you do drying with solar energy if possible. So with that you can actually convert, what do you do? When you clothe your dry, dry your clothes, you're using solar energy to dry. When you're making papad, you're using solar energy to dry. Only thing now you do it in a process, in a way that it is 24 times 7, it, there is no dust, there is no contamination, because it's all in a closed chamber, and it's a constant temperature, because otherwise at night, you dry a product during the day, at night suddenly it starts absorbing water because there is no sun, so it is hydroscopic, so it draws water again. 
so it loses color it loses essence so i think solar drying is a great untap area next <coughs> this is something again okay, you laugh about it this is solar crematorium this is a crematorium to burn dead bodies dead bodies i said not alive yeah and this was a great lesson for me not a technology actually what happens is whenever someone comes to us to show the power of sun we have a piece of pool of uh, we put a piece of paper in the focus of the sun and the wood it starts burning immediately so normally whenever someone saw that they would say wow and they would stop at that but a old man who could not read and write in the village came and he did not stop at wow he said hey that's great can you burn dead bodies with solar energy and i nearly fell down i said are you gone i said you know like in hindi we say satya gaya after 60 your brain goes away i said kaka satya gaya tumhara I, if I'm not finding, I, I'm finding it very difficult to convert people from normal cooking to solar cooking. How will ever people switch from normal crematory to solar crematory? Because it's not waste to your burning. It's a dead body with soul. There is a lot of emotion, spirituality. It. People will not accept it. And he says, you know what, Deepak? You are a technocrat. You look after technology. I am a social scientist. I will do that. Take care of that. And I said, you do not know what you are getting into. After a few months, he came back. So I said, hey, kaka, kya hua? Tumara solar crematory ka idea? Mar gaya kya? He said, no. And he gave me a check of six lakh rupees. So I said, what's this? He says, I want to place an order for solar crematorium. And I was really surprised. I said, how did this guy, you know, I am Bombay, German return, technocrat. I'm not able to even convert people from normal cooking to solar cooking. And he has been able to sell a product even before it was made. It is only in his idea. He went to villages and told, I want to make solar crematorium and people started giving money. So I asked him, how do you do it? So it is very simple. I made a small model. I explained to people the problem. I went to Puttaparthi to Satya Sai Baba and said, in my village, there is not enough wood. Can you bless it? If you bless it, people will accept it. Baba said, Tathastu, it's accepted. <laughs> so we can also use... <laughs> so we can also use spirituality and science to combine together. And for me, it was a big lesson. Because what we have is knowledge. What this man had was wisdom. He knows how to stop you arguing. Because we Indians, we can keep on arguing on any politics. If you say this is black, he will say it's white. We can say it's white, it's black. We like to argue and we never come to conclusion. But this man brought a single conclusion. Baba ne kaha hua hai, no argument. Paisa de do, upar jane milega apne ko. Wo bhi solar energy se. So this is solar crematorium. It's a great technology. Just imagine in India, we have got 700 million Hindus. And every body requires 200 kilogram of wood. If you multiply, there is not enough wood in our country to burn all Hindus. So what's happening? In big cities, we have got electrical crematorium. In small villages, we have got gas-fired crematorium. Why not solar? We say Surya Dada, Surya Bhagwan. Why not use this energy, the clean energy? And it's very simple. It's possible. In France, there are ovens where you can melt uh, gold. Means you, can temperature, you can get temperature of 3000 degrees centigrade where you can melt metals and all. So why not dead bodies, you know? So it's a spiritual way of doing it. So this is a solar crematory next. Uh, then we started looking at different technologies. Said, why are we only becoming a product provider? Why can we look at this? So this is where my friend comes in, Mr. Mr. Phillips. He's from a company called Mithras in Germany. And we said, in process industry, most of the energy, 70% of the energy which is used by industry is for heating. And the temperature you require is about 200 degree, 250 degree centigrade. So we can easily do it with solar energy. Next. Uh, there are various technologies like you have this trough concentrator where you have a line focus. Then you have a dish technology where, as you said, we can reflect the light onto the heat exchanger. So we said, we look at add another one more technology. So this is a technology called trough concentrator, which we are trying to bring from Germany to offer it for industry. Because my solar dishes cannot sit on the asbestos roof because they are like wind sails. Every dish is 16 square meter. Lot of wind load, lot of weight. So trough has an advantage. It can sit onto the parallel to the roof, and it could be easily installed. Next, this talks of various technologies. We have this linear Fresnel technology. There is tower technology, which is from Acme in India, where they are putting many, many flat mirrors, lifting light onto a tower. Temperature is 200 degree, 2000 degree centigrade. They have a molten salt, which they produce power. But then they are all viable about megawatt scale. 20 megawatt is the smallest viable size. Whereas we can do one kilowatt, 100 watt to few hundred kilowatts. And for me, the market is not in megawatt. I think the Indian government has made a mistake of going into this megawatt policy, this Jawala Nehru solar mission, where we want to install 20,000 megawatt solar power plant. We all think that Reliance, I'm sorry, I'm staying in my Reliance guest house, I should not be criticizing that. But we believe in scale of economy. We think that we can become cheap if we have this scale of economy. Perhaps the product is cheap, but what good is the product to me if we, it doesn't help the people? If people are not, eh, technology is for the people, not people for the technology. And I think any technology which is developed without people in the center is not going to be accepted because that will create Maoism. The biggest threat to our country is Maoism. That is because we are becoming richer by day and they become poorer by day. We need to involve them. We need to part make them participate. We need to make them owners only then we will grow. So I'm sorry I'm diverting from technology into human aspect, but I think that goes hand in hand together. Next. So this is the way a concentrator works. You have a solar field where you heat the oil 
and then you store it and then you can produce uh, steam and then after the steam is a conventional cycle all the power plants run on steam in India uh, whether it is coal or gas fired so this technology I did not have to develop turbines and all was available only I had to re re replace the boilers with solar energy so there are hundreds of megawatts of solar plant coming up in India which is a great development but for me 550,000 villages where each and every village has its decentralized power plant Gandhi was a visionary, he was right. I'm talking of Mahatma Gandhi, not Rajiv Gandhi. Uh, yeah, he was also right, but Mahatma Gandhi was better. Uh, so he said, the future of India lies in villages. The future of India lies in decentralized power. So this is what it can offer. It not only produces electricity, it can produce waste heat, which can be used for air conditioning, cold storage, desalination, so co-generation. Because of that, your efficiency goes up. Again, I will not talk too much of technology. If anyone is interested, can always visit me or talk to me afterwards. Next. This is the way the world is looking at uh, the share of renewable energy has born to grow, grow to grow. It's not a question of availability. Even if tomorrow Reliance is to announce that we have found millions of cubic meter gas per day, we will not be able to use it because every time you burn fuel, you're producing CO2. And every time you produce CO2, you're creating global warming. So even if this fuel is going to be cheap and economical, there is no option for us but to use solar energy and renewable energy because that's where you are carbon neutral. Because otherwise we will be having money but no life, quality of life. Next. Next. We started looking because basically we soon realized and you will be surprised that we are 25 years old. How come there are not enough people are using this? Because it's very expensive. Solar energy has a big problem. The upfront investment is very high. And then it's dependent on subsidy. And subsidy, wherever there is subsidy, there is corruption, there is bureaucracy, there is paperwork, there are delays and all. So the idea is how do we tap into new financial resources? And we came across a system called CDM, that is carbon credit where when you use solar energy or renewable energy, you're not producing CO2, and those carbon credits can be sold to the developing, developed nations, and they pay because they have made a commitment to reduce the carbon footprint. So I think we need to be innovative and look at not only technology, but also financial mechanisms to make it sustainable. Next. So, and another, as I started, I said, biggest problem I realized or faced was people did not have the money to buy. This is a smoke-free village we did. We have done four smoke-free villages where the whole village cooks on solar energy. So how did we do that? Next. Basically, first we thought it's a question of affordability. So I went and offered, now that I had some money, I went and told villages, okay, you cannot afford it. If a rich man can buy a car or a TV in installment, I will give you my solar cocoa in installment. And I thought people will take it. Because everyone, everyone says poor people are the good people. It is the only industrialists who are chore, you know, who will take depreciation benefit, tax benefit, and go bankrupt, you know. Like Kingfisher, he, has, he wants to drink 80 lakhs rupees bottle for whiskey, but he doesn't have money to pay the salary to his airline. Because that is a different department. I'm sorry. Sorry, Kamalaya. But... <laughs> uh, so basically, I was surprised. So I asked the poor man, all the time people told me, you are good people, so how come you are becoming bad? You are also spoiled by the city. And they said, no, Deepak, try to be in our seat. I don't mind paying money, but why should I pay? Because I am replacing something which is free, the wood, with something where I have to pay. So I have no advantage to it. So I told him, but uh, your wife is going to collect three hours of uh, uh, in sun to collect the wood. He said, it's my wife, not your wife. Why are you worried? You know? <laughs> so sorry, but these are the realities. <laughs> Um, it's, the problem is like it was not about his wife or something, it was a question of priority. Means is my wife, I said, I don't do anything at home, I don't do anything at home, I don't do anything at home, I don't So, uh, I realized that it was not a problem of uh, not being wanting to pay, but it, they were replacing something with something wrong. So then I looked for a solution. When I say I, it was always me and my wife, because without my wife, I, would have, I came into it because of my wife. I stayed into it because of my wife. So we came into idea, we said, look, we have to remove poverty. If we do not make this poor man into rich man, he will never be able to buy it. So how do we do that? So we came up with a new concept which is said, okay, you buy this solar cooker, it's not a solar cooker, it's an income generation tool. We'll teach you how to make bread, biscuit, cake, jalebi, gatia, pakora, all out of it. And you sell it, we'll help you sell it, so now you are paying from your profit, not from your pocket. So I think this is the concept where we can actually do social engineering. So it's not just engineering, it is social engineering so that it becomes affordable to more people. Next please. And we are surprised, you know, like we, as I said in India, there is a difference between knowledge and wisdom. What you see here is a person using a solar cooker for ironing. I was very proud to see that. Heads off to her. She gets a Nobel Prize because she's... I get temperature of 300 degrees centigrade. Why do I need to cook? I can put my iron with stone in there and I can cook. I can save 100 rupees of coal which I'm buying for ironing. Great. So poor people are perhaps not able to read and write, but they are survivors. They know how to improvise and make a living out of it. Next. This is the most nice picture for me. What you see here is now, normally when you close your eyes and think of a village woman, you will think of a village woman carrying water or wood. Hmm? But here she is carrying a solar cooker. The solar cooker comes as a do-it-yourself kit. She can take it to the village. She can install it herself. The cooker is, comes with the installation manual. 
it, uh, it is all pictorial so that she can install even without uh, reading and writing. And what we have seen is that people who cannot read and write are able to install the cooker better than people who can read and write because they don't apply their mind. The moment you start applying your mind, you make mistakes because you think you're smarter than me and that you are not. So uh, sometimes, so this is again a great picture. Next. Then again, we said storage, complex, and 70% of people live in villages. Why can't we again use what is available, the local resource? Sun is a local resource, but it's available only limited time. You know, have you ever asked yourself, India is perhaps the only country in the world where we do not have the word good morning in our language. We do not say suprabhatam. You know, we say Jesse Krishna because we need God more than the sun because we are our problems all the time. The because of a sun we take for granted. We know that 330 days or 300 days the sun is going to rise at 6 o'clock in the morning and set at 6 in the evening. It's only the Westerners who have to look in the sky, you know, kya kapda pe ro chata lo ke nahi. So that's why we, have, we don't use, we have taken our sun for granted. So the local resource is taken for granted. In the same way, there is a big local resource. 70% of our people live in villages. India has got 3% of the land area, but we have got 15% of the animal population. So we said, why can't we use that, you know? What is the local resource, the cow dung? So there was already a technology called KVIC biogas plant, which is called Goberglass, where you put the cow dung into a tank, it ferments and gives you gas, which can be used for cooking. But again, the problem was, now no one, no poor man wants to keep animal. Because if you put a cow, then you have to get up at 4 in the morning and do milking, you have to take the cow dung. Now no one wants to take cow dung. In old days, we had our houses made of cow dung, the walls made of cow dung. Now, it's shit. Why should I touch it? You know, I'm sorry, but the perception of modernity is changing. I, I don't blame them for that, because ultimately we are the models. You know, we live in concrete houses with uh, tiles. So a poor man also wants to do that. He forgets that for his climatic, microclimate zone, perhaps that cow dung house is better because it is more hygienic, it is breathing, it is you know, letting water through. But anyway, she doesn't want to cut a cow dung. So we need cow, bio, community biogas plants. So now we've got larger biogas plants. But the problem is now you've got a biogas plant which is far away from the village. You cannot use the gas because it's too far away. So then we develop the technology. Next. So this is a village which we did uh, in uh, Surat called Bhidbudrak, where we've got two biogas plants. And then we take it into a water column and then increase the pressure and then pipe the gas. So the whole village, just like in cities, we have got pipe gas. Our villages have got 120 house. 120 house gets, every house gets a pipe gas in their house. They come and sell the cow dung. It's a concept called Gober Bank, where when a farmer brings the cow dung, we weigh it and write it down in the passbook. And then against that, he gets a gas. You know, so there's a barter system. And then sometimes he gets money or sometimes he has to pay the difference. And then we sell the fertilizer that is coming out of it. Next. So uh, this is the slurry which is coming out of the cow dung. So now you see it's, uh, it's okay. Uh, so it's a slurry which comes out of a cow dung. It's the best fertilizer, organic fertilizer than get. get. The cow dung itself will have a lot of problems of uh, mosquitoes uh, and uh, flies and all the other uh, rats and everything. But once it comes out as a slurry, it is very clean. You can actually then take it to vermicomposting Sorry. and uh, don't, don't worry. You can take it to vermicomposting with earthworm, you can convert it to solid waste where it could be like, like urea, it could be stored, it could be taken to the farm. So I realized that biogas is a technology. So we need to work in hybrid system. Daytime you can use solar energy, in evening you can use biogas. Also in monsoon when there is no sun, you can use biogas. So we started working on that. Uh, 